afternoon. We were very fortunate there to listen to three very powerful speeches, which uh, I thought offered not only words of wisdom, but sent a very clear message in the context of the work of this Honourable House and of the commitment to culture and to peace. And we have, over the last two days, focused upon that interrelationship I mentioned earlier about developing a literacy, be that faith literacy or cultural literacy. But there's also an issue of stewardship, stewardship of the environment, and the role of the environment as it relates to interpretation within the context of sacred text. And this final session will focus upon the environment and allow us to have the opportunity to learn from different perspectives and to listen to a range of issues as they relate to Islam, Christianity and Buddhism. Our first speaker is an individual who has made an enormous contribution on an international stage in defining and interpreting what does harmony really mean. David Cadman as Harmony Professor of Practice at the University of Wales, Trinity St. David, has made an enormous contribution to this study. He is also a visiting professor at the University of Maryland and is a trustee of the Prince of Wales' School of Traditional Art and a fellow of the Terminus Academy. He has undertaken the role of coordinator of developing the Harmony Project within the University, within the University of Wales and is actively involved on an international stage in refining the critique and the language which allows us to embrace what does it really mean to be involved in harmony. It gives me great pleasure to invite him to the stage. He is a Quaker who has been committed uh, in that discipline. And before uh, the start of this session, he asked whether it would be possible for us to reflect in that tradition in a minute's silence before he starts his deliberation. Mesdames et Messieurs, standing where I am, at a distance, somewhat at a distance from you all, it is very difficult for me to tell which of us is venerable, which of us is excellent, which of us is distinguished. And I hope, therefore, you will forgive me if I address you this afternoon simply as mes amis. My topic is harmony and integration. We live in a time of division, and we live at a time when social, economic, and environmental conditions worldwide are being described as critical and in some places catastrophic. We live in a time of disintegration and separation and a time of conceptual dryness and drought. At such a time, especially amongst young people, there is a deep thirst for wholeness, integration, and meaning. We have, therefore, an urgent need for disciplines and practices that draw us together, that enable us to see the world and ourselves as whole. 
And I want to propose that we may find this possibility of wholeness, connection, in the discipline and practices of harmony. We have become who we are because we have been told a story of who we are. And the story we have been told is one that tells us that we are by nature brutish, selfish, and violent. This story has dominated for a very long time. It is the story that has brought about the rise of a selfish individualism and consumerism which now plagues us. It is what Mrs. Thatcher was telling us when she said there was no such thing as society. And it is what is meant by those who point to neoliberal ec economics as the rule book for reality. It is the story that has given us a widening gap between those who have and those who do not. The loss of species, the degradation of soils and of fish stocks, the crisis of climate change and the financial chaos and collapse of the international banks in 2008 and 2009. All of these come from this damaging story, for it is the story of separation and division. <clears throat> and at the root of this story lies the proposition that the world is made up of separate parts ever in competition one with another. Now more recently we've been told another story. One that tells us that everything is apparently related, interconnected, and whole. And yet, despite this, the old story persists. And we remain in a place where, the wor where words of wholeness and integration struggle to be heard. And we continue to manage our lives not least our forms of education, in silos. One subject or one activity seldom being connected to another. We study biology, physics, chemistry, philosophy, history, geography, language and literature, medicine, theology and economics, each one set within their long-established boundaries, and we think nothing of it. But suppose this is no longer fit for purpose. Suppose that in the interconnected world that has now been revealed to us, we need something else, a new, integrative discipline that enables us to understand how things are across and not just within subject areas. A discipline that adds meaning to knowledge. I want to propose that the name for this discipline is harmony. For harmony speaks of balance and order and relationship. It is concerned with parts within and only within a whole, and of wholes within wholeness. A whole and its parts are always interconnected and related. One affects the other, neither stands alone, and both are always in flow. And please note that this harmony is not the same as sustainability. Sustainability, in its most commonly used form is instrumental, posing questions about how we and our children's children may survive. By contrast, harmony embodies broad and all-embracing principles about the nature of the cosmos and our relationship with it, or rather our relationships within it, because we are a part of and not apart from. 
Its principles are timeless. It asks questions about ways of true being. The way things are, not the way we would like them to be or might seek to manage them to be for our own benefit. Harmony is expressed by nature. And since nature is ancient and endures, it provides us with teachings that we might do well to notice, to follow, or mimic. It was, I think, Janine Benyus who was the first to bring biomimicry to our attention some 20 years ago. And since then, in her books and in her teachings, she has shown us what we can learn from nature. We can take nature's best ideas and mimic them, apply them to our everyday lives. The silk of spiders, the patterns of growth of prairie grass, the shapes and consistency of seashells show us forms that have come about over very long periods of time, forms that are enduring, beautiful, and useful and we can copy them. And beyond the characteristics of nature are nature's processes, her ways of being, her ways of doing things. They too provide lessons of how to be part of an endearing and vital wholeness. And when we look, we see that nature expresses qualities such as wholeness, relationship, diversity, living within limits, cooperation, wastelessness, impermanence, and thriftiness. The most frequently men being mentioned are wholeness, diversity, and relatedness. Not quite the qualities of being we might note that lay behind the words, no such thing as society. Indeed, the very opposite. These qualities speak of community, belonging, and even perhaps of what the Buddha described as the four divine abidings, loving kindness, compassion, joy in and for others, and equanimity. So it is perhaps possible that rather in, than imposing upon nature principles of our own making, we might do better to listen. Listen attentively to that which nature tells us. Look, look carefully at what nature shows us and follow her. Taking nature to be our teacher and exploring natural systems, the patterns and rhythms of the cosmos, we can discover principles that express the essential qualities of harmony, principles of harmony. These include the following, wholeness and relationship, limits and resistance, flow and self-healing, and then, perhaps more controversially, love and justice both of which were referred to this morning. Let me say a, a bit about each one of these. Wholeness and relationship. <clears throat> Perhaps the most evident principle of harmony is wholeness. And by contrast to the old story of separation, above all else, wholeness provides the metaphor for a new story. We are with each other and with the earth. We are in community. We belong. And everything is connected, interconnected, entangled, intertwined. And these relationships are mutual and marked by reciprocity. There is a continuous movement betwixt and between. Relationships means diversity within a whole. 
And as I shall explain in a moment, these are loving relationships. Nature understands limits and boundaries and resistance. <clears throat> we deny limits, seeking ever more growth in our economies and in our consumption. And we do this despite all the evidence that shows that this is not only false, but dangerous. In 2004, the 30-year update was published of limits to growth. Although the original publication had warned of the dangers of unlimited growth, its tone had been optimistic. We could change. 30 years later, that optimism had gone. We had not changed. And it was clear that we had moved beyond the carrying capacity of the earth. If that was so in, nine, in 2004, how much is it so today? And then there is resistance. In case any of you should suppose that harmony is too soft a notion, I suggest that it must embrace resistance. If wholeness, balance, and order are lawful, so too is resistance. For it is by the law of resistance that new forms of harmony may arise. It is by rubbing up against resistance, by pushing through the ground of resistance, that new shoots of harmony come into being. Resistance requires that we ask questions about our ways of being. Look critically and afresh at what we are doing. It prevents complacency and dogma and keeps us alert. All that is in nature flows. It is in movement. Over less than a second or over thousands of millions of years, but flowing, movement, impermanence. As the Buddha said, coming to be, coming to be, ceasing to be, ceasing to be. Everything is moving and transforming, including the very principles that we think in a moment we have observed. Furthermore, nature heals herself from within. It is part of who she is. And then we come to love and justice. There is a systemic order of intertwined and entangled patterns and rhythms that constitute a form of governance that, if followed, would align us with that which is good for us and for the earth, arises not simply by way of detached intellectual inquiry, but also by experience, by practice and participation. For I find that when I live my life as if it is ordered by harmony, harmonious relationships are inclined to manifest. And I claim that the governing principle of this harmonious ordering is love. Not love as virtue or romantic sentiment, although there's nothing wrong with either virtue or romance, but love as being of the essence of shaping all that is. Love is everywhere expressed in the good relationships between all that is, including us. And it is evident. In any one day, there are many more actions of love than there are of acts of selfishness and violence. For most of us, in the everyday detail of our lives, love is a much more common experience than hatred or aggression. That is not to say that we do not know conflict, but that most often it is resolved within loving relationships. And it is expressed in nature. We know that one tree within a forest nurtures not only its kin, but other trees its roots sustaining and protecting, and the giving and taking of life in nature 
when seen in terms of the whole, is also a form of love, a reciprocity. Everything, including you and me, is being eaten and in the end returns itself to the ground. Sacrifice. We may not understand it, but it is there and we are part of it. And that is love at work. The seed that falls in the autumn and rests in the winter ground before it shoots in springtime is love at work. Where love is not present, life cannot be. And that is surely the, torching, the teaching of all the great spiritual traditions, and this is what I find to be true. When we are harmonious, we come together in the manner of right being. The order and proportion we express in this being is of necessity the order and proportion of justice. Right relationship, proper relatingness of the parts to each other and of the whole. Now we've come to assume that justice is a man-made thing, and I use the word man here intentionally. <clears throat> but this is a modern notion. We think we make justice in the making of laws and the giving of rights. We think it arises from what we do. This is not what the ancients thought. For them, justice was innate in nature. We may discover it and align ourselves with it, but we do not make it. It is already there, waiting to be discovered and can then be expressed in our true being. For the, for the ancients, the cosmos was conceived as being lawful, a lawful harmony of the parts. In that sense, it was just. And if a society was not just, it could not be harmonious. Without justice, there could be no harmony. And the ancients saw this in this way because they regarded the whole as paramount. The common good was what mattered, not the separate well-being of the individual or individuals apart from the whole. So justice was the law that connected each of us ethically with society and with all things. It expressed a truthful relation with reality. And justice was grounded in the good. It was an inherent quality in all things, in the natural order of a good society. Thus, societies that are not just are an aberrant form and therefore will always bring harm to us. And this is surely what we see today. How then do we act justly? Not through our own will, but through our right being. By allowing principles of justice to be expressed in our lives together. It is about our relationships, one with another and with the earth. It requires us to consider the well-being of the whole, the common good, common to all of us and to the earth. It requires us to look at the connections between one thing and another and the effect of one thing upon another. It is not complicated, but it is a challenge since it is at present countercultural. It cannot fit a model of reality described by neoliberal economics. But of course, that model is no more than something that some people have made. And it is to be questioned. It is not innate. And I would say it is not truly lawful. And if it is not lawful, it is not in accord with nature and cannot, will not, endure. And so, in conclusion, 
Let me say this. If these are some of the principles of harmony, what sort of discipline are they describing? They describe an integrative discipline. It is a discipline that offers us the possibility of discovering and understanding the relationships between diverse parts and a whole. It takes as a given a world that works within limits, a world ever in flux. It is rooted in justice and love. It adds meaning to knowledge. And it is more than a philosophy because it has to be expressed in practice. The process and the outcome the means and the end are inextricably intertwined. There is no harmony without being harmonious. There is no wholeness without integration. So if we are to tackle the many and present difficulties in a divided world, may we find in principles of harmony taught in our schools and in our universities and practiced in our private and our public lives, might we find the necessary and urgently needed language and practice of integration? I think we may. Merci, mon ami. Thank you very much. You have set there, I think, a framework where our speakers will now consider those very broad principles that you articulated within specific faith disciplines and traditions, where we look to harmony as balance, order, and relationships. We now will consider initially from Islam and from the context of Islam. And therefore, it gives me great pleasure to call upon the second speaker. Mr. Ibrahim Abdul Matin, a Muslim environmentalist, a philosopher and writer, an individual who has uh, focused upon sustainability and has written several policy statements and advised several leaders, and in particular the New York City Mayor, Michael Bloomberg. And it's a great pleasure for us to have you here to address the House. Thank you. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Um, there we go. <laughs> Work with me, please. My name is Ibrahim Saleh Abdul Mateen. I'm the author of Green Dean, What Islam Teaches About Protecting the Planet. All right. There we go. Okay, good. Living a green dean means understanding that everything comes from Allah, that we recognize that Allah is the creator and the sustainer of everything, tawheed or, or oneness. Living a green dean means seeing everything in nature, everything in the natural world as a sign or an ayat of the creator. Living a green dean, dean means the path or the way. Living a green dean means understanding that God created us directly from the earth and that we must do all that we can to take care of it, protect it, manage all of its bounty in a sustainable way. Following a green dean means knowing that we are entrusted this amana by God to act as the stewards or the khalifa of the earth. This trust is a promise to protect the planet. And it comes with the gifts of speech, knowledge, and the freedom to make decisions. God has given us the ability to make decisions over the land and the animals. And he entrusts us to be responsible with this gift. We can choose to cooperate with nature or not. We can choose to be inspired or burdened by this trust. Either way, we will be held accountable for our actions. Those seeking to live this path, a green dean, should understand that communities without control of political and economic power often suffer disproportionately the negative effects of environmental pollution and environmental degradation. We seek adil or justice. 
Living a green dean means knowing that everything in creation is made to exist within a perfect balance or misan. But most importantly, a green dean starts with a self-reflection. We need to get right within ourselves in order to treat the earth as a sacred place that it is. Truly, the way we treat the planet is a reflection of the way we treat our own selves. All right, we're good. Right. <laughs> um, in my current role, I serve as the Director of Community Affairs at New York City's Department of Environmental Protection. We manage the city's water supply and our wastewater infrastructure. I like to say we're ensuring free access to clean water, transforming waste management, and making government more responsive to citizens every day. I should also add that I'm on the board of the Living Future Institute, which has created building and product standards that are helping re people renegotiate their relationship with the earth. I am, of course, a son, an older sibling, a younger sibling, a middle child, the second child of six, a former football player, American football player. I am a husband, father of three boys under six years old. And if you met me in the summer of 1999, I would have simply said, I'm a poet. What I primarily do for work is operate as a translator. I make sure that regular people understand what the planners and architects and engineers do to maintain one of the most astonishing water supplies and removal systems in the world. In my career, I have, I have consistently been in this translator role, and I hope that my experience is useful for today's discussion. In the past, I have also been an educator. In 2000, I led week-long outward-bound expeditions for Boston middle school students on an island in Boston Harbor. In 2002, I was part of a group that included Brooklyn's Prospect Park and the Botanical Garden, which conceived and started the Brooklyn Academy for Science and the Environment. I share this all so you know that I am passionate about the topics and the issues that we are exploring. So about you. First, I must acknowledge that I am a creation of the creator of the universe. It is my understanding as a Muslim that the creator of the universe created all of our souls long before and, there, and that there was a time and a place in that long before where all of us, some of us souls, became acquainted with one another. Being soulmates, if you will, doesn't need to be as serious or romantic as we think of it. But there's nothing wrong with that. But I would hope the noble purpose for which we have been gathered here would identify all of us as soul mates. Perhaps in that gathering of souls before the Creator put us into these bodies, we were actually all of us in community as well. Perhaps we sat in a similar setting, discussed what it means to be in harmony, discussed what it means to be at our best. So, in the spirit of the comments earlier this morning, I'm approaching this conversation as if we are already neighbors, we are already relatives, and we have managed to come together once again. So the questions that I ask are about our current state and what impacts our ability to live and thrive and live in harmony. One important factor is increased urbanization. Lots of different factors have been driving people into urban settings for thousands of years. But right now, it is at a whole different scale. The city is the way that we live together. And urban living has challenges. One main challenge is climate change. It's safe to say that climate change is changing the ways that we interact and manage our resources. And since I live in the United States now, if you don't like to say climate change, then we can talk about the impacts of days, over 90, of days over 90 degrees, the impacts of sea level rise, of increased intensities of storms, and of soil erosion. We talk about this in terms, 
in, in terms of resources and scarcity. But for a moment, I'm going to veer away from that for a moment and apply a lens from Google's Sidewalk Labs and think about this in terms of people in space or density. There are some costs and some benefits, or rather efficiencies, to increased density. As laid out by Rohit Agarwala of Sidewalk Labs, there, there are some efficiencies. For example, density enables much lower consumption of resources and time. Density enables higher asset utilization, means we all sit at the same benches, we all use the same tools. Density entails frequent physical interactions, but there are also some costs. Density leads to a reliance on centralized systems. Density increases the need for courtesy and trust. It also requires deeper coordination and more negotiation. So what is our shared story? Humans develop a, sh a shared story to understand moments. Right now, we're in a moment in time when religion and science and politics have all have a similar narrative. Whether it's about climate change, the increased, increased threats of polarization, extreme talks in politics, the end of times, the end of the world, it's all that we seem to be talking about. Perhaps this narrative this shared narrative is something so dramatic that the only words we have for it are about the end of things. Perhaps it is the end of one thing. I am part of a community of thinkers that see this moment as a period of transition and a time to nurture whole people and whole communities, to transition from a world of domin domination and extraction rooted in my sensibility of a green dean, to a world of regeneration, resilience, and interdependence. I talk about this as an aspect of this in Green Dean. On September 27, 2008, over 50,000 Americans in 700 communities across the United States stood up and said, America is ready to build a new economy. We're ready to save the planet and people. We're ready for green jobs. One of those 700 communities was the Anacostia community outside of Washington, D.C. At this Anacostia Green Jobs Now rally, Mike Tidwell, who's the director of the Chesapeake Climate Action Network, noticed he was speaking on the lawn of a church and spontaneously said, we need to get our energy from, from heaven. We need wind and solar and waves instead of energy from hell, the stuff extracted out of the ground, like oil and coal and gas. Extraction causes imbalance, whereas energy from heaven is like a gift from above. Energy from hell is energy that is derived from the ground. It's extracted from the earth. It is dirty. It's a major cause of pollution and climate change. Energy from hell is non-renewable. It takes away from the earth without giving back. It disturbs the balance, Mizan, of the universe and is therefore a great injustice, Zulm. A green dean calls for maintaining the earth's balance and treating it justly. And in the Quran, there is no mention of coal and oil and gas, but the Quran guides us to use the power of the wind and the sun. This narrative of transition is not about destroying the way that we live now totally. Sorry about that. <laughs> Um, it means simply finding the best ways to solve persistent human problems of how to provide heat, how to find clean water, how to manage our human waste streams. These are persistent problems. How to protect the natural world around us and feed and be in some partnership with the earth to produce what we need to flourish. Extraction is about raping. Extraction is about pillaging and leaving the earth barren. Regeneration is about making deserts and war-torn and ravaged lands bloom again. Regeneration is about permaculture. Extraction is about the past. Healing scarred land is the path of the future, and it is what we are transitioning towards. So what is the role of the faith community in this transition? Back in Brooklyn, 
New York, where I'm from, we have a way of being in space together. It is really an island culture. It's a big island. So people talk freely and openly in the streets. We have this perspective that we're in this together. That was, that was very clear in 2003 when, we, when the Northeast suffered the largest blackout in the history of the country. During the blackout, I thought about how people look to their faith traditions for answers in time of uncertainty and seek medit solace in meditation or prayer. I wondered, what would it look like if during the blackout, all the houses of worship across the land, all the churches, all the temples, all the masjids, all of them were shining beacons of light instead of darkness. We need to operate as translators. Our faiths transcend borders in a way because, of, because in this period of transition, we have to think differently. Now it's time to think less about borders. We have to make we have to think more about watersheds and food sheds and the economic systems that sustain life. If you are a religious leader, as we are making this transition, you have to accept that people, our young people, your young people, people will not listen to you. Our prophetic traditions have trained us for this moment. Think about the stories and know that sometimes the people will not listen. They don't always listen but they will be paying attention to you. The faith community has to lead by example. We have to be in harmony. We have to exist within it. We have to practice what we preach, all of us. And we must support one another. This is a space of support and we have to continue that support. We have to, and this is what it looks like, I'm going to give three examples of ways that we could move forward together. Religious inst institutions can fill the gap and aid us in this transition from extraction to regeneration. <clears throat> For example, universities traditionally funded good ideas. However, today, many are trying to take ownership of ideas generated on their campuses. Additionally, corporate research is myopically focused on ideas that produce profit, as opposed to ideas which are about regeneration. Maybe it is time for our religious institutions to become the place, places where innovation happens. Rethinking waste. How do we know so much about the supply chain and know so little about the removal chain? There is value in our waste stream that we have simply overlooked in our rush to burn and scrap and throw trash away. Innovations in waste management can be as simple as making a goal to reduce waste altogether. The state of Sharjah in the UAE has made this a priority, and Bayad Environmental is, is the company leading the efforts. Now, religious institutions, houses of worships, communities of faith in our urban areas should be the best neighbors and model best practice in this regard. And finally, we have to create new models. One example, our community-supported agriculture. In basic terms, community-supported agriculture consists of <clears throat> community of individuals who pledge to support a farm's operation so that the farmland becomes legally or spiritually the community's farm. With the growers and communities providing mutual support and sharing the risks and benefits of production. Typically members or shareholders of the farm pledge in advance to cover the anticipated costs and in return they receive shares in the farm's bounty throughout the growing season. Communities of faith can do this and lead this effort. Now, simply, let's roll up our sleeves and get to work. Thank you very much. It's good to hear the dynamism, the creativity, and the enthusiasm within that presentation. Thank you. And focusing, of course, on the importance of that narrative of transition. We move now uh, to consider from another context, Christianity and the environment, and it gives me great pleasure to call upon Dr. Catherine Williams, who is reader in New Testament studies at the University of Wales, Trinity St. David. She's also a research fellow at the University of the Free State of Trine, South Africa, and she has served as vice president of CATIN, the ecumenical body in Wales, 
and is a member of the Standing Commission for Faith Order within the World Council of Churches. Kreisa Kanesha and Katrin. Thank you very much, Diolchen Vaur. Well, good afternoon to you all, guests, delegates, and friends. And uh, I was asked today to give a, a short presentation on the environment from a, a Christian perspective. And as you can see from the, the title of my paper, I've chosen to focus specifically on the question, the goodness of all creation. What does Christianity have to say on this topic? Environmental issues have dominated the political, social, and cultural discourse for well over a decade. With only a very small number of organizations now and a few individuals yet to be convinced that the current ecological crisis is the most significant challenge facing the world today, and that it requires reflection and action on a global scale. Given the prominence and urgency of all matters relating to climate change, what role does faith, but in particular now this, in my particular presentation, does Christianity and its institutions play within the current debate? Some church leaders have certainly been vociferous in voicing their concerns. In his 2015 encyclical Laudato Si, Pope Francis attributed global warming directly to human activity, declaring that the earth, our home, is beginning to look, and I quote, like an immense pile of filth. The Christian church, however, has also been severely criticized for not playing a more prominent role and for not taking more decisive action. As one commentator recently noted, the churches are latecomers into the world of converse conservation. They've had to go and be pushed, shoved, and cajoled into noticing that God's creation is going down the plug hole and going rapidly. They've had to be argued with and debated with to allow a shift away from an almost totally human-centered understanding of God in creation. It's even been proposed that the church has not only been plagued by inactivity, but that its biblical and theological teachings have in fact been instrumental in decades of environmental vandalism. As long ago as 1967, in what has since become a well-cited article on this topic, the historian Lynn White argued that the worldview developed in Western Christianity has legitimated and encouraged humanity's aggressive project to dominate and exploit nature. Christianity, claimed White, is an irredeemably anthropocentric, a human-centered religion, one which adopts an arrogant and wholly superior attitude towards the natural world. The Judeo-Christian tradition has, moreover, been accused of dismembering the world. That is, maintaining a firm distinction between humanity and its non-human inhabitants. A strict dualism between flesh and spirit, between all things material and spiritual, prompted the well-known Christian thinker St. Augustine to claim that there is no place for nature in the kingdom of God, only spiritual beings and eternal souls. It's frequently suggested also that the emphasis in Christian teaching is so much on God's transcendence, on his otherworldliness, that the orientation towards nature found in other religions stands in stark contrast to the Christian evaluation of human history and human history alone as the locus of divine activity. Now, unsurprisingly, these criticisms have been subjected to close scrutiny by contemporary Christian theologians and biblical scholars. 
and are primarily concerned with one question. Is the Christian tradition really underpinned by such an ecologically negative worldview? More specifically, does the Christian Bible, the Old and the New Testaments, promote human exploitation and manipulation of the created world? In a move towards developing a greener and more eco-friendly theology, questions are asked as to what the Bible might be able to contribute to the debate on the current environmental crisis. What kind of views of the earth are presented in the Bible? How does it relate humanity to non-human life? And what kind of relationships are envisaged between God, humanity, and the rest of the earth community? Now, one possible approach is to search the Bible for some valuable resources that can promote an environmental ethic, a basis for action. This approach, which is often labelled a strategy of recovery, seeks to retrieve those ecological gemstones that may have lain hidden or have been misinterpreted by generations of interpreters of the biblical text. The aim, then, is to rescue the Bible from the accusation that it is shaped by a human-centred worldview, one which seeks to legitimise aggressive domination of the natural world. However, it's not enough or legitimate simply to ask, what does the Bible say? As though one can just gather together all the relevant biblical passages and showcase their green credentials their green content. Bringing the Bible into dialogue with environmental issues must also acknowledge the diversity of the biblical material and the ambivalent, often very challenging nature of some of its most well-known passages. For this reason, biblical scholars are increasingly concerned with identifying doctrinal keys, things that are the product of an attempt to construct a relationship between three entities. That is, the text, but also text with tradition, text, tradition, and context. Bringing all these three elements into central focus helps interpreters to identify and to work more responsibly with those biblical texts that relativize the importance of humanity and stress the inclusion of all creation in God's plan for the world. So a major aspect of this biblically informed ecological lens is that it looks anew at what the Bible teaches about God as creator. This is where the biblical story begins, in the book of Genesis, and where it ends, in the book of Revelation. And from beginning to end, the ancient writers are concerned with the world that God made, declaring that everything has its place within God's creative activity. The book of Genesis even includes two creation accounts. The first, an orderly account of God's creative acts of speech over six days. But while all created beings are said to possess life or breath, only humanity, in Hebrew, Adam, is described as having been made in the image of God. So what does it mean to be created in God's image? The first chapter of Genesis gives the answer which is embedded in God's own command. Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. That's one of the most challenging words in the whole of the Hebrew Bible, to subdue the earth and have dominion over every living thing that moves upon the earth. Now, does this imply that humanity is given complete freedom to do as it wishes with all non-human forms of life? The divine command here in the book of Genesis certainly points to human authority and to control. But the narrative's central focus is on God's sovereignty over the whole cosmos. The world was not made for the benefit of humanity so that it could exert its superiority over everything else. No, the world was made, according to Genesis, for the glory of God. 
all created beings, including human beings, are to be answerable to God. And the detailed description of God bringing into existence all forms of life, animals, birds, plants, and trees, serves to emphasize that humanity is one part, not the sum total, of God's creative plan. One Jewish rabbi writing during the second century CE perceptively recognized the potential dangers of humanity's exalted estimation of its role in the world. And he commented like this, God, he said, has deliberately created all of the things before he created Adam, the first human being. Otherwise, Adam would have claimed to have created all, of course. So for the biblical text to claim that human beings are created in God's image does suggest that they are deemed to have a special purpose. If it is God who has dominion and power, humanity is created to represent that power on earth. And this means that humanity is called upon to reflect and imitate those attributes belonging to God which are revealed by him. Love justice, the pleasure he takes in his creation. Immediately after these words that are on your screens now, it says, God saw everything that he had made, and indeed, it was very good. As his representatives on earth, humanity's responsibility is to care and protect the world on God's behalf, and to do so in a wise, just, and loving manner. Now, in the second creation account recorded in the second chapter of Genesis, it's precisely this communion, this harmony between humanity and the earth that's highlighted. Here, Adam's primary function is to be the head gardener. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to till it and to keep it. So stewardship in this respect involves cultivating and nurturing the land, protecting the garden, and encouraging it to be fruitful. Now here, this is the divinely ordained and highest form of human experience. So the overarching message of the biblical creation accounts is that all created beings are dependent on God, and this is what underpins unity between all forms of life. The dilemma, of course, is that humanity then proceeds, according to Genesis, to misuse its God-given authority. And as a result of the disobedience of Adam and Eve taking the fruit from the tree in the garden, the harmony, the shalom in Hebrew, between God, humanity, and nature is destroyed. Disobedience and abandonment lead, according to the text, to disorder, and the earth loses its productiveness. So what we learn already by the third chapter of this sacred text is that the struggles and woes of humanity are the struggles and woes of the natural world. And yet, God doesn't give up on his creation. The interconnectedness of humanity and the rest of the earth community returns in the story of the flood. That well-known account of human sinfulness and its destructive effects upon the environment. If both humanity and the earth are the, object of the objects of divine judgment, now both become the recipients of divine promise. The story of the flood stresses God's unceasing care for his creation, while the protection of Noah, his family, and all animals in the ark serves as a kind of microcosm or ecological parable of life on earth. Created beings, two of each species, dwelling together in a confined space, seeking, seeking shelter from the threat of water. And then after the flood, God establishes a covenant, not only with Noah, but with every living creature, you'll note, that is with you, the birds, the domestic animals, every animal of the earth, with you. The covenant is all-embracing. In both creation and covenant, humanity is inextricably bound with the earth's non-human inhabitants. 
This notion of interconnectedness also reappears in the teaching of Jesus in the New Testament Gospels. Drawing upon Jesus' own upbringing in a rural community where life is shaped by the productiveness or otherwise of the land. Jesus' images of planting and harvesting, caring for one's flock, all function as his vivid illustrations of God's presence in the context and content of everyday life. In the New Testament, the inseparability of the human and natural words is extended to embrace final salvation and deliverance. The early Christian vision of new life in Jesus is modelled closely on the earthly environment, and for that reason it provides a useful resource for Christian eco-theology. The entire creation, claims the Apostle Paul in his letter to the Romans, is to participate in the promise and hope of future salvation. His words are well known. Creation, he said, will be set free from the bondage to decay and will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. Both humanity and the rest of the earth community share a common fate, one which is linked to the restoration of the harmony originally intended by God. And this is why Paul speaks of Jesus as the second Adam, the second human being, the one who brings about the restoration, brings back greenness to the Garden of Eden. And it's also why the author of the book of Revelation, the last book of the New Testament, recounts visions of paradise regained, a new heaven and a new earth at the end of time. This can only be the Garden of Eden restored, all that God intended from the very beginning. The potentiality of creation is realized in this vision in an ecologically inspiring image of final restoration. I have only been able to scratch the mere surface of the biblical material that can be drawn upon to offer a religious response to the environmental crisis facing our fragile world. But as I draw to a conclusion, there is no doubt that the texts in question have been and continue to be distorted and misinterpreted in certain circles, with the Bible being manipulated in an attempt to separate, even alienate humanity from the fate of the environment. There is, of course, no escaping the fact that the biblical narrative centers primarily on questions about human existence. We cannot escape that. And that the non-human world is, to a large extent, depicted as reliant on the activity and representation of humans. So given that the Bible recognizes that both humanity and the natural world are inextricably bound together, but that it is humans that set the agenda in relation to environmental damage and its protection, all facets of a biblically informed eco-theology must place human responsibilities and actions in the world at the centre of its environmental ethic and its vision for the future. Thank you. Thank you for that detailed critique. We now move on to the final paper, and it gives me great pleasure to call upon a colleague who will focus upon the Buddhist tradition, Buddhism and the environment, Venerable Shang Miao. And for those of us who, who know him, who know him well, I think uh, we are indebted to him for the enormous work that he does to support the Venerable Master. A very warm welcome to you, sir. Respected Professor Hughes, fellow speakers, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. I'm very honored to be here to share with you the topic on Buddhism and environment. 
Today, from the Buddhist perspective, I would like to talk about how environment is created and how we can change our environment. One, how the environment, how is the environment created? The flower ornament scripture says, mind is like an artist who is able to paint the words. The five clusters of mentality and materiality are born dense, and there is nothing it does not make. It tells us that our environment is the product of our minds. The way our minds produce the world is like an artist producing a piece of painting. Therefore, by looking at what our minds are like, we will know why our environment has turned into what it is now. Our minds are full of greed, anger, ignorance, agitation, and so on. Hence, our environment presents to us disasters, turmoil, starvation, illnesses, and more. Meanwhile, environment is like a mirror that reflects what our minds look like. Therefore, when we face the current environment and feel dissatisfied, is satisfied, we must not blame others, but should first of all reflect upon our own minds and find the root cause of the problems from within. The Dhammapada says, mind precedes all phenomena. Mind is their chief, and they are mind-made. When with a corrupted mind, one should, should e either speak or act. Then suffering follows one, just as the wheel follows the ox's hoof. It also says, mind precedes all phenomena. Mind is their chief and they are mind-made. If with a pure mind, one should speak or act, then happiness follows one just as one's shadow never depart. These two pieces of Buddhist text clearly describe the law of causality. If one speaks and acts with a corrupted mind, the resulting environment will bring one suffering. If one speaks and acts with a pure mind, the resulting environment will bring one happiness. Using this principle to observe the world, we can clearly see the fact various awful environments that we are in are indeed the result of the common karma generated by our ear actions, ear words, and ear thought. Which with advanced science, people today enjoy more comfortable and affluent lives. But it consequently arouses excessive greed and desires in us. As a result, human beings endlessly exploit natural resources and have severely damaged the natural environment. Subsequently, one after another, a series of disasters are experienced around the world. Information today is highly developed. However, the human minds have become more easily corrupted. In this respect, media must take a huge responsibility. 
the entertainment programs that the ancient enjoyed were healthy, because they heeded maintaining the pure minds of the audience. However, many entertainment programs in the modern days are unhealthy, because producers are profit-driven and do all they can to stimulate the audience's sense organs. Consequent, consequently, all kinds of violent, erotic, and extravagant scenes endlessly invade the, in, the audience and severely corrupted their minds. The endless violent scenes appear almost real, and they fill the minds of the audience with the violence. As a result, similar violence scenes truly occur in real lives. The endless erotic scenes are on the increase and they evoke deviant thought in the audience. Hence, people's mind grow astray, morality and ethics are abandoned. People commit adultery, and family are broken. All these are the main root causes of current social problems. Extravagant scenes keep escalating, and they evoke the audience's admiration for unrealistic extravagance. Consequently, people chase after fame and profit. They even seek profit at the expense of righteousness and do things that benefit themselves but harm others. Two, how to change our environment. To change our environment, we must start from its source. The source of all kinds of environment is the mind. Therefore, we must first of all purify our minds. As it is said in Buddhism, when the mind is pure, the world is pure. We should start from ourselves and gradually influence our families, our communities, the society, and the world. First, we should have a strong sense of mission and take on the responsibilities for saving the earth under the betterment of the whole humankind. Next, we should carefully protect our minds and avoid them from being corrupted by external environment. Then, we should improve our moral character and our state of cultivation. Only when our minds are purified can we help purify those of others. Pure thought can indeed change our environment. Let us look at three examples. There is a little bay in Lake Biwa in Japan. As the water in the bay does not flow, it is dirty and turbid for a long time. Once, a Buddhist master took over then 350 people with him and single-mindedly recited together to the lake, the water is clean, the water is clean. And it lasted for an hour. Three days later, the water in the bay truly became clean. The original algae and odor of the water disappeared. The media also had a special report on this. And the purified effect lasted for a fairly, fairly long time. 
Dr. Hugh Lin of America used a traditional Hawaiian healing system, Ho'oponopono, to cure a group of mentally ill criminals with his thought. He did not have any direct contact with the patients, but sat in his office, looked at their fire, and cleansed in his own mind. He understood that the reason why he saw these patients was because his divinity self had gone wrong. Hence, he told himself that he must take full responsibility for them. Afterwards, he focused on expressing repentance, gratitude, and love for his div divinity self. As such, he peacefully cleansed his mind twice a day and half an hour each time. Gradually, what he did started to take effect. Within the span of a few months, the patient's conditions started to alleviate. Eventually, all of them recovered and left the hospital. And the clinic for the mentally ill criminals was closed. Loving kindness meditation is also a powerful approach to purify our minds. In this practice, a meditation practitioner comes down and gives a loving and kind thought to a particular person or a group of people such as wishing them happy. This practice can truly improve interpersonal relationships and promote a harmonious atmosphere. The Buddhist approaches to purify the mind can be summarized into three learnings, namely discipline, concentration, and wisdom. Discipline means abandoning evil ways and performing wholesome deeds, namely no killing, no stealing, no sexual misconduct, no deceptive speech, no slander, no abusive speech, no enticing speech, no greed, no anger, no ignorance. And it also means protecting lives of all beings, giving unsparingly, practice chastity, speaking faithfully, harmoniously, gently, and meaningfully, letting go of attachment, showing unconditional love and compassion, and cultivating wisdom. Concentration means improving the level of concentration with the one-pointed mind. Wisdom means clearly see the truth of life and the universe with the light of concentration and opening up our wisdom. With wisdom, we are able to eliminate worries and corruption of our minds such as greed, anger, and ignorance, and obtain a true purity of the mind. In practice, a vegetarian diet is an excellent way of protecting the environment. To meet the demand for meat, human beings rear a large amount of livestock the practice not only exhausts a large amount of food and clean water, but also produces a large quantity of greenhouse gases, which cause a great damage to the earth. Adopting a vegetarian diet can effectively avoid the above issues. In fact, a vegetarian diet is good for not only protecting environment, but for our physical and mental health. 
เอพิล็อกบินอเวกเกิลด์โอเดลูดิดอิสวีดินอัซิงเกิลทอตบินพิวริฟายด์โอคารับติดอิสอัลโซวีดินอัซิงเกิลทอตอิดิสอิกจักตัวอิกจักตัวเดสซิงเกิลทอตดัตฮัสปรดิวส์ของเราเมนเทนเดอะสเตทของอเวกเกิลอันเดอะเพียวมายน์อะบอยด์ดิลูชันอันคอร์รัปชัน If we can live, work, interact with others, and handle matters with such a state of mind, our environment will become better and better. I hope that we can work together and make our world cleaner and more beautiful. Thank you very much. Can I thank all of the all of the speakers for their presentations? I'm mindful of the time. Uh, it has been a very long day. Uh, it is worth, as we now bring this second session to a close, perhaps just to remind ourselves of some of the key statements that were made at the beginning of the day, when we reflected upon the importance of this conference within UNESCO's key theme of the International Decade. For the rapprochement of culture, uh, where we reaffirmed the importance within international dialogue, a commitment for a global vision, and commitments to unification in diversity. What we have focused on in the last session is a clear commitment to identify together, be that within the context of culture, of religion, or of stewardship of the land, the balance, the order, and relationships. And to celebrate the diversity that is within the whole, that diversity, of course, has to focus upon a narrative, a narrative of transition, and that transition reflects the political and cultural imperative within a global context. But that transition depends upon a clear covenant, a covenant of understanding and stewardship, if you like, with a strong sense of mission. That strong sense of mission has been articulated by so many of our speakers today, be that related to faith, to culture, or to stewardship of the environment. The empowerment of the mind, the articulation of words, of theories, of concepts, all depends upon a common conviction: to do good, to do good, to integrate disciplines, to care, and to secure justice. And hopefully. This session today has been part of that journey, that journey of transformational change, that focuses upon diversity, that secures the opportunity to work together for a better world. Thank you for your deliberations, and we look forward to seeing you tomorrow. <laughs>